my flow starts around six. So it's basically about an hour ish. If I sleep until six, then it's seven. But I try my best to be up by five because I know that those early morning hours, the other reason for me is, and as a leader, many of our listeners will uh, agree with this. I get more done when others are asleep. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. We're often using our time, energy, and priorities unstrategically. So we don't think of time in terms of what Kevin Cruz said, what I've suggested, you know, that um, you only have a limited amount of time. You have to use it in particular ways. And if you use it where you're leveraging your energy in connection with your time, it's going to go better. And then we we have so much inbound. When I was writing the book, and it took, took me a few years to put together, so this isn't just pandemic related. Like we were stressed long before COVID. We were stressed long before the global pandemic came along. But I counted up the number of inboxes I had at the time. So this is like circa 2019. I have 11 inboxes, <laughs> which is silly. Like your parents and grandparents, they had a post office box, like a mailbox at their front door or at their, the end of their driveway. And once a day, the letter carrier would drop off some mail. That was it. And maybe you had a neighbor who knocked on your door once. Now, everywhere you go, on every device you own, people are messaging you. You go to social media, you've got inboxes. You go to personal, public inboxes, multiple email addresses, you have inboxes. You go to LinkedIn, there's an inbox over there. Everywhere you turn, someone is asking you for something, and it's it's overwhelming. There's a psychologist, Robin Dunbar. Have you guys ever heard of Dunbar's number? It's not particularly well known. Yeah. I have not. So how many friends can one person have? Number? 150 that that's how many people we are wired to know. And almost all of us would have well over 150 social media followers. In many cases, thousands, tens of thousands, millions. We're not wired to know that many people and that leaves us in the stress spiral, overwhelmed, overcommitted, overworked. And what's so fascinating about that is all of those inboxes are constantly notifying you. (laughs) <laughs> and it dims your ability to listen to your own personal notifications, right? Those own That's warning really well signals said. you have that my energy is low, that I'm way too emotional about things, that I'm not showing up at my fullest. You know, unfortunately, everywhere we turn, there's a little red circle with a number in it on every single application we interact with. And if you're like me, I don't want to see that. So I'm constantly trying to get to inbox zero, get this, clear this out, move this around. And I'm expending so much energy on things that ultimately don't matter to my own core values, to my own mission, to what actually gets me up in the morning. And part of what we learned in restructuring our own day is, yes, we all get the same amount of time, but we don't have the same rhythm to our time. So I'm much better early in the morning. And I didn't really know that. I was making tons of excuses that would allow me to sleep in to deal with the burnout. And then when I actually started focusing on my mornings, getting up earlier, working out, then getting into my day, when I was able to orient my time around when I was at my best and then structure my day around that, I was exactly like you said, leveraging it to see those exponential results. See, this stuff makes me so happy, AJ, because that's exactly what the book's about, right? So as you started diving into this material, and the whole concept there is everybody's got three to five hours in a day where they are at their best. And this is now, brain research is is proving in the last decade, what I figured out anecdotally on my own as I painfully tried to reconstruct my life. But like, I like to think of myself as a robot, right? I can just go 18 hours a day and I can't. And I'm, I have a lot of energy. If you follow the Enneagram, I'm an eight. We're the challenger. We're big and bold entrepreneur, right? That kind of thing. So it's like, if there's a wall, I'm going to break through it. And what I learned is apparently I'm also human. Apparently (laughs) my, my energy does not stay the same throughout the day. So I encourage everybody and I will play this little game if you guys are willing to identify their green, yellow, and red zones. So think of your day 
as three types of energy zones. Green being what you've already hinted at when you're at your best. Your energy is flowing. You're bright. You're generally speaking, you know, assuming you didn't have a crazy night the night before or the toddler didn't wake up at 3 a.m. screaming, but just in normal days, this tends to be the time of day where you're at your peak, your mood is good, your energy's flowing, you're in the flow. Uh, for creatives like us, if you're writing something, you feel really good. Johnny, if you're composing a song, you know, it's flowing, the lyrics flowing, the music's flowing, that kind of stuff. So you're just in that flow. When would you guys say that is for you? AJ, you said morning, right? So yeah. do you have particular hours, like 6 a.m., 8 a.m.? When, when does that flow start? When I'm up by 5 my flow starts around six. So it's basically about an hour-ish. If I sleep in till six, then it's seven. But I try my best to be up by five because I know that those early morning hours, the other reason for me is, and as a leader, many of our listeners will uh, agree with this, I get more done when others are asleep. <laughs> because <laughs> as a leader, your team needs stuff from you and you want to uh -huh. be there and you want to be supportive. So for me to get up before the slack's going crazy, before my inbox is dinging and, and all the things that I try to do to wall that off, I still am human. So I found that that space in the morning, my phone's not ringing. I'm not getting requests on Slack. I don't have check-ins with the team. That is my moment to really shine to get through all the big heavy duty tasks that I need to feel like I accomplished something and then structuring my day on the back end meetings and then getting into my inbox when I'm lowest in energy. I used to think, however, based on my college experience and graduate school and my struggles with procrastination, that I'm a night owl and, you know, I could pound out an essay at night. I could get my research in and get those results when everyone was out of the lab. And that just became what I thought I was. So I would hit the snooze bar, sleep in, orient meetings later in the day. We even started our, our training program later because we were both night owls and we would make excuses around it. And then we started to realize uh, in training for the half marathon and working with our personal trainer that he only really had time to train us in the morning. So it kept waking us up earlier and earlier and earlier. And what do you know, getting some uh, shuttle sprints in at five in the morning, coming <laughs> off that exercise, <laughs> feeling like I'm in my complete flow state. I'm like, why was I sleeping through these hours? What was I thinking? Gosh, you know, in my final year of college, I picked all of my courses to not start before 11 a.m. I didn't even <laughs> yeah. care what the subject was. It's like, don't start now. I'm up like you. I'm up at 4.30 to 6 a.m. most days. Uh, how about you, Johnny? Night owl, morning person, what are you these days? At least in my... At 47 later, in my later years, I have come to be comfortable with the idea that I am a morning person. I get, I am, I do my best in the morning. I don't know what that was like in my early 30s. I could say some different things, but, but the, the productivity and my mood and how I, my energy all coincides with that. And, and what, what I do for to wake up is I'm usually up between 6 and 6.30. I have a, 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 a 6.45 alarm set up, which is the, the you can't sleep any longer than this, but if you're that beat up, then you can sleep till this time. That rarely happens. I could count that on one hand in a month, but uh, usually up and, by, and at the gym at, at, at the latest 6.30. And, and that, and, and once I'm in the gym, I'm slogging it out, but I am it. I am, I feel amazing after the gym, a shower and, and having that first cup of coffee. And, and that's when I start, I start looking over stuff that I want to do. I start arranging my schedule. I'm, I'm fired up. I'm looking at how the rest of my day is going to go. What needs to be scheduled. If anything else, uh, it hasn't made it to my calendar. Uh, but, but the problem with that. And knowing and understanding that is I run into the, the trouble of I slamming too much stuff up front because I'm the most excited at that time. And so I'll start powing everything during from that 9 to 12, 8 to, nine, 8 to 12 time period. And sometimes I get, I, I fill it up too much and I'm, I don't get done what I need to get done. Then I get angry and I get frustrated and I need to just chill out of like listen you you have tomorrow <laughs> just put that in but 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 in learning that 
made me very excited to schedule things during that time because I know that I'm going to not only engage with it, but I'm going to do it with a lot of energy and excited. And and I also don't mind trying new things at that time because I'm my energy and how I treat myself is much better. So if I get frustrated, I'm learning something new, it's okay. I'll have an, pour myself another cup of coffee. I'll relax, I'll work through it. I know that I'll learn. Um, where if I try to do those things later on, I just start beating myself up and, and my I'm not as resilient as I am at that time. So all of that plays a role. And so my day is scheduled uh, through that and uh, from the yellow time and, and the red time as well. We drop great content each and every week and we wanna make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. I was just gonna share what I also found. So I used to be a proponent of the typical American breakfast. My family raised me that if I didn't finish breakfast in the morning, I couldn't leave for school. And I was forced to chug that glass of milk. I had to finish breakfast. And it took a while to break out of that. But when I actually started intermittent fasting, so not having breakfast at all and waiting until lunch when I'm starting to hit my yellow zone, it actually created a green zone for me after lunch. Whereas when I was doing the heavy morning breakfast, I was just feeling lethargic and robbing myself of that green energy cycle. Oh, brilliant. Well, this is a good case study, two case studies in real time. So people are wondering what we're talking about. It sounds like the morning club. Don't beat yourself up if you're not a morning person. So I find for a lot of leaders, a lot of people who do what we do, mornings are the green zone for most people. But the point is simply this, and it's transferable. If you're a night owl, actually, according to Daniel Pink, most people are afternoon people, believe it or not, midday people. They're not morning, they're not evening. But the idea is you have three to five peak hours of energy a day. Cal Newport says you have about four. Other brain researchers say you have about three to five hours. And for all three of us on this show, it happens to be in the morning. And what, what you do is you're supposed to do what you're best at when you're at your best in your green zone. Then the other two zones, just to get those out of the way so people understand, red zone, you're tired, then you feel like you need some caffeine or a nap or run around the block or someone to punch you so that you can stay awake at the meeting. For me, that happens around 4.35 every day uh, where I either need to get on my bike, have a nap or do something mindless like empty email, my inbox, right? And then everything in between is yellow. You're not at your best, you're not at your peak zone, but you're functioning okay. You're just not gonna do your best work. So to drill down on the green zone a little bit, and this is where the exponential returns happen, and you, everybody will approach it a little bit differently. You now need to, okay, I know when I'm at my best, so figure out those three to five hours, and the spike after lunch, I get that too. Um, I also get that little spike between one and two. I can accomplish some really, really good creative things if it's a good day. Uh, you won't get more than five good hours in a day. It's just not the way humans are wired. It's not in our DNA. So you're not gonna get that. Nobody's, nobody's that good. So three to five hours, what you then do is figure out what is the most important thing in your case for the art of charm that you do. And it could be interview prep. So I gotta read this book and ask, you know, cultivate the, the questions or get the interview uh, flow down. Or it could be you're working on a new course, which as you know, I've seen your products, they take a lot of attention and a lot of focus. You're not doing that in between phone calls or Zoom calls or that kind of thing. Like you've got to sit down, it's deep work. Um, for others, it might be strategy or we're not growing with the problem that you started this podcast episode with, right? Oh my gosh, it's a pandemic. 85% of what we do just went down the toilet. Now what do we do? You're not gonna solve that in a five minute break between meetings. That takes your deep focus. So whatever, if you're in accounting, it's like a better PNL or a really good pivot spreadsheet or some pivot table in your spreadsheet or something like that. You can tell I'm not from accounting. But um, <laughs> you know, my son writes code. I have an adult son who, who writes code for a living and he's got three to five hours where he has to write beautiful code. There is such a thing. And so what you want to do is want to figure out, okay, that is my most, most meaningful contribution. For me these days, it's content. It's editing the book. It's prepping. I have a podcast as well. You know, it's prepping for the big interview. It's doing background research. It's figuring out where my industry is going and how I can take my company there before it gets there. 
So if I do that most days for three to five hours, you are so far ahead of the curve. And then Johnny, to get into what you were saying, where sometimes you can beat yourself up because you try to cram too much in, it's the repeated discipline. It's like going to the gym, you know, one day is not gonna qualify you for the half marathon. It's going in there and doing the 45 minutes or the 30 minutes or the hour, you know, four days a week, multiple months. That's what gets you ready. Same with your green zone. What happens to a lot of gifted people, and we all have a gift somewhere, is we end up using our gift but never developing it. So I'm a communicator. If you were to put me, let's say we're at a conference together, you're like, Carrie, the keynote guy, he just canceled, you know, his plane's not gonna land on time. Can you get up there and give a talk on productivity? No notice. I could probably do it. And I would do an okay job because I've done this most of my life. Uh, but if you do that time after time and what happens when you don't do this, right? The course is due. You've got to ship it out and you guys would never do this, but we've all been caught once or twice by shipping a substandard product where we're like, you know, if I only had one more month, if I only had one more week to work on it. And that's when you cheat your gift because you use it, but you never develop it. So in your green zone, do what Malcolm Gladwell said as he popularized in Outliers, start developing your gift. Don't just work on the project, read a book about the field. When I was in law, you know, how do I become a better person at cross-examination? How do I read the case law that nobody else is reading? So next time I go to court and face this situation, I've got an argument the opponent will not have. I'm not gonna use that right now. That's how you become best in the world at something. If you're doing, let's say, three hours of, of really important, significant work that moves the needle, most days in your green zone, and then you spend that half hour or hour a day reading in your field, developing your skill set, taking a course, um, going to the eighth draft rather than the third draft of whatever project you're working on, that is like putting money in the bank that just produces interest. At first, you don't really notice it, but boy, three years from now, you're gonna, you're gonna crush your former skill set. And that's where the real productivity in thinking of your day in green, yellow, and red goes. Because otherwise you don't get it done and you go home and you're stressed and you throw up all over your family because you didn't get it done again. 